Hello and welcome back and today we want to do another comparison of Synology and QNAP. I know, how many have I done recently but bear with me, this one's quite interesting. This is where we're looking at two 10G solutions from their respective brands. We've already covered them in a number of ways and I will talk a lot more about the hardware than the software in today's video so do bear that in mind. But this is the DS1621XS 10G solution versus the TS973 a X and it is the H973AX at that. It's important and I'll tell you why later. But both of these are very, very interesting solutions from their respective brands. They've both embraced 10GBE, they've both embraced their own respective file systems, but they've gone a very different way in architecture. And because of that, their price points are very different too. And if we're looking at a 10GBE now at the end of 2020 or early 2021, then chances are these two are on your radar as they are compact 6-bay and 5-bay solutions respectively that bring a lot to market. But got to talk about that price tag. Uh, the QNAP arrives at about £850 to £860 without tax and without hard drive or SSD media at the time of recording, which again isn't a small sum of money. The Q, I'm sorry, the Synology on the other hand arrives at around £1,650, including that and not including media. That is an enormous jump of nearly double that of the QNAP. What exactly does this Synology give you that's worth that much more money? And that's mainly what this video is about because I could sing lyrical about the software of both of these brands for a while. They've both got surveillance tools in Surveillance Station and QVR Pro. They've both got virtual machine tools in Synology Virtual Machine Manager and Virtualization Station. They've both got container tools in Docker and Container Station. They've both got multimedia tools, Photo Station, Video Station, Music Station. They both support AI-assisted um, photo recognition in Synology Moments and Synology Photo in DSM7 and QMAGI on the QNAT. They've both got, again, um, music and video handling. They support Plex Media Server, both on with them. They both have their own file management applications with um, the Synology arriving with Synology Drive and File Station, as well as backup tools in the form of Active Backup Suite, which is a multi-tiered single portal backup strategy app, and Hyper Backup. On the QNAP, you've got QSearch, QFiling, and File Station combined with Hybrid Backup Sync 3 and a bunch of other VM tools on both of them as well. Synology have got the collaboration suite with Synology Chat and Synology Mail and Synology Calendar and Synology all over the place. They have got apps that replace all of your third-party tools and it's all inclusive with the device. The QNAP, on the other hand, has a number of tools for mail and calendars and schedules and notes and stuff like that, but when uh, there isn't any chat applications in the first party, although there are third-party support things like Skype. On top of that, it does support applications um, for um, editing documents and Excel sheets with add-ons from Office 365. Currently, the QNAP platform allows you to synchronize with cloud services in a number of ways that aren't available quite yet on the Synology that will come soon in DSM-7. On the, in the case of the QNAP, we are talking about things like hybrid mount that allows you to bolt on cloud storage and use all of the proprietary apps on it as if it was localized and in reverse with virtual JVOD allowing you to attach a free areas of storage or the whole NAS to another NAS or a cloud area as a blob of uh, virtual JVOD storage for it to be utilized there. These are things that are coming from Synology in their likes of hybrid share and more but there's also other add-ons as well, such as BoxSafe from QNAP that allows you to synchronize in an intelligent and manageable way with services like G Suite and Office 365. Again, these are things that are being rolled into DSM-7, which aren't quite available. So a lot of the things you're buying this Synology for are coming soon or are here now, but only just. So where is that money going? Why are you spending 800 to a grand more on this device shopping around? Well, it comes to a few things. First and foremost, though they're both 10 GBE NAS systems, it's worth highlighting that the Synology is both a 10 GBE equipped NAS, but it also has PCIe upgradability. The QNAP, on the other hand, has a 10 GBE port 
but no room to upgrade an additional port. And the PCIe Gen 3x8 on this Synology allows you to utilize stuff like um, increased dual port 10G cards, 20 GBE cards, 40 GBE cards, although you're never going to saturate that on a on a six bay NAS like this. And although both of them are expandable, it's worth highlighting that the Synology allows you to add two five bay expansion devices to dedicated eSATA ports on this and increase your storage by 10 drives. This uh, QNAP on the other hand is a little bit more flexible in its USB expansions and some of these expansions take advantage of USB 3.2 Gen 2 so 10 gigabits per second expandability so I'm not sure the Synology has an advantage there but the PCIe upgrade slot is certainly one of the ways in which it does gain ground on top of that the Synology arrives with a warranty of five years which is the what you expect from any of the XS series now that five years of warranty it counters the three years of warranty that the QNAP arrives with. It can be expanded or uh, extended, but it will cost you more. So, if you do care about warranties, that's another area where the extra money is in this device. It's also worth highlighting that they both arrive by default with eight gig of memory, both of them with DDR4 SODIM memory, but it's ECC memory there on the Synology. The, they both arrive up to 32 gig, but it's worth highlighting ZFS later on that this is also available in a 32 gig version, reasons for which we'll touch on later on. Now, the CPU inside both of them is actually quite different. The 973AX arrives with a Ryzen uh, embedded based SSC chip, the one that's available in the 1621, not XS. It is a quad core 2.2 gigahertz uh, processor, 64 bit x86, it's the V1500B. And it does get a lot of the tasks done. However, to take advantage of all of the things that this can do with ZFS, that's right, this is a ZFS equipped NAS, you will need at least 16 gig of memory to take advantage of all of its services, including deduplication. So although you've got 8 gig, know that you can't use quite all of them without increasing the memory by default. You do have huge advantages to ZFS such as removing the volume from the layer of storage, thereby putting data directly on the storage pool for faster access. But on top of that, RAID resilvering, oh sorry, RAID rebuilding, RAID building in general, in fact, and RAID uh, resilvering of replacing drives is significantly faster with a RAID 5 on this, taking mere minutes, single minutes, compared with the hours and hours and hours that this system here takes to build its RAID 5. Now, I say RAID 5 because this system does not have SHR, Synology Hybrid RAID, and that, for a number of you, is going to be a big blow. It has a great CPU inside. It's got a Xeon quad-core in there, the 1527. A little bit older than some of the Xeons out there at the moment, but Synology have done a hell of a lot of work on this processor. And a Xeon-based CPU with 8 gig of ECC memory needs to be respected. Unfortunately, because it's an XS series device, it does not arrive with support, as mentioned, of SHR. It supports BTRFS with um, file self-healing, shared folder creation made a great deal quicker, and other features too, but it doesn't quite measure up. Not having SHR on this device is just a bit of a killer for some of us out there that really enjoy the flexible, fluid nature of that RAID configuration, being able to add bigger and better drives along the way. And I think that's one of the main building blocks of the Synology brand, particularly in desktop form, that a number of buyers are just a little bit sad is not present on the XS. Now, between the two of them, if I had to pick between BTRFS and ZFS, I'm likely going to choose ZFS personally. I think a lot of it is to do with the performance benefits, but also things like triple parity uh, RAID configurations, RAID Z as well. I just think there's a lot more going for it in that regard. But just remember that you aren't dealing with a Xeon processor here. You are dealing with a slightly weaker CPU and you have to upgrade the memory in its lifespan. So it's not all perfect. And that's one of the main ways in which this system makes a bit more of that. That money back now both of them arrive with caching storage they have different storage media support inside and this is a very very important distinction between them because it's another way in which the brands have gone 
a very different way. The Synology arrives with six SATA storage bays with SATA hard drives currently available in 18 and even 20 TB from Seagate Iron Wolf right now. Um, and on top of that, these bays also support two and a half inch SATA SSD. So again, that's your Seagate Iron Wolfs again, going up to four TB currently or 3.6 or 3.72 terabytes. Um, on top of that, inside there is two NVMe M2 SSD bays used for caching. So you can utilize super fast 4,000 megabytes per second NVMe's and then bestow the high IOPS and high performance onto the slower uh, but more affordable and larger capacity hard drives and improve the internal performance that you can enjoy with VMs and databases internally, but of course with 10 GPE and more out the rear of it. Now, on the QNAP, we have five SATA bays here at the top, so one less SATA bay, although all of them do support, again, Seagate so Iron Wolf there at up to 18 and 20 TB in NAS hard drives. But what's interesting is it also has these four SSD bays at the base, these top two are NVMe U2 SSD bays. These two bays here support the larger, just as fast NVMe SSDs, along with two SATA SSD bays there on the base as well. That means you have a triple tier storage system with SATA SSD, U2 NVMe SSD, and traditional SATA hard drive. But what's really interesting is you can use not only all four of these just for SATA SSDs if you want and then upgrade to U2 NVMe later because the port works for both. But on top of that, you can use all three tiers as raw storage. You can create storage pools on the SSDs dedicated and therefore have tiers of super fast access, which a number of you are going to be swayed with straight off the bat. Synology kind of... I don't like the idea they only let you use those NVMEs for caching, and I think a lot of you agree with me, because it's one thing to have a lot of their systems only have one GBE on the rear, which I know annoys a number of you with the likes of QNAT and, and on this device, not only providing 10G, but also 2.5 GBE at times as well. But those M2 NVMEs being locked for caching only can be a real pain when you've got 10G systems like this. It's a real shame because I love this box. The 1621XS is a real groundbreaker for me and it tells me exactly that Synology still take this stuff seriously with a middle ground solution that gives great internal and great external capabilities. But they are lagging a bit on that network interface side of things, I believe, and M2 only being used for caching particularly as a brand that have brought their own range of SATA and NVMe SSDs to the table. I think that's a tiny bit short-sighted, but we'll have to see. Um, ultimately, between them, the what you get with the Synology is a smoother and far more user-friendly user interface. You get a better CPU in terms of raw power and CPU benchmark rating, although you will have to find a similar CPU because the precise CPU is no longer there. You get ECC memory, which is always good long-term you get that PCIe upgrade slot as well. It's a future-proof system. But if you're looking at today, and this isn't just today because it's still quite future-proof, it's just less upgradable, the 973AX is still a solid, affordable, ZFS-powered solution with NVMe U2 bays there on the front, a compact nature, and 10 GBE and 2.5 GBE on the back as well. I haven't even touched on design, which is always going to be your own choice between these two systems about which one deserves your money. And moreover, it's worth highlighting that the QNAP here has a smaller PSU at 120 watts, whilst in utilization with the Synology at a 250 watt PSU. It needs it for the PCIe, the increased CPU. It needs it to just have more to keep it moving. So between the two of them, it's up to you which one you pick because I know deep, deep, deep down, if I had the money, I'd probably err towards the ZFS system if I am on a tighter budget. I think the Synology solution delivers a lot for the money and I do think it's five year warranty delivers and you do have a five-year NAS here. I just wonder about a number of you guys out there whether you're going to leverage your budget towards storage media, the system, or a little bit of both. And if you're in that last category, the 973AX has got a lot to, to offer you. So, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Again, we do lots of software overviews and we are comparing 
BTRFS on this versus ZFS on this just after this video. So do check that out. But click like if you've enjoyed the video. Click subscribe to learn more. And visit the guys at span.com if you need help choosing the right NAS for you and get it right first time. Otherwise, visit the links to NAS Compares for the full breakdown and comparison of this. These two NASs, let's be honest. I will see you guys next time.